Hello, everyone, and welcome to our second Facebook Live with Mayor John Southers. Mayor, thanks for being here. Jen, I'm glad to be with you. And we're going to tackle some questions that we received from residents on our various social media accounts. Uh, most of them have come to us today from Facebook and Twitter um, on various topics. So we're going to get right to it. Um, we thank you for joining us during this lunch hour, um, and we hope to do this again in case we don't get to the question that maybe you're most concerned about, but we hope you will learn something along the way. We'll start with affordable housing today, um, and we have our first question question from Tanya on Facebook. What can we do to address affordable housing for the elderly as well as for the young? Well, we're trying to address affordable housing for everybody, and it's a big issue. Um, what we've got in Colorado Springs is a red-hot real estate market. We've got a significant uh, increasing rents, and for people on the margins, uh, even our some of our employed folks who don't make a lot of money, it's uh, putting a lot of pressure on them. Uh, we want to uh, encourage development of affordable housing, and the city does that uh, through some grant money through the federal government, uh, housing and urban development. Uh, it does it in some public-private partnerships in which developers get tax incentives to build affordable housing. And people have seen some examples of that. We've got about three projects underway now, and I'm pleased to say, you know, we're averaging about 500 new units a year, we need to accelerate that, uh, but I would say probably the majority of those are available to seniors. Okay. Uh, and we've really got some really good uh, senior projects going. There's going to be one uh, built this year, I think it's 240 units. So uh, seniors are very much in mind as we address the affordable housing problem. Okay, next uh, topic is development. And we have a question from Matthew on Facebook asking, what can be done to encourage real mixed use development? What developers are currently passing off as mixed use isn't really healthy for the city? Adding a strip mall to a suburb doesn't count. You know, that's a great question because that's really what Plan COS is all about. We've had this uh, program over the last two years uh, where the city has been taking input, uh, formulating uh, its first comprehensive plan in over 15 years. Mm -hmm. And the whole purpose of it uh, is to, you know, what do we want our neighborhoods to look like? What do we want new development to look, about, look like? And a lot of it has to do with mixed-use development, you know, what do PUDs look like? And making sure that we have Stapleton-like neighborhoods uh, with commercial uh, residential, retail, things like that. And uh, that's what it's all about. And I, I think we've gotten some pretty good input. And I think he can feel fairly comfortable that as we, for example, develop Banning Lewis Ranch, we'll be talking about genuine mixed-use development. Okay, great. And that process is still going on, Plan COS. So you can visit our website for more information on that. Um, moving on to homelessness, we have a few questions on that topic. Um, Natalie on Facebook is asking, with the huge amount of homeless people in our city, wouldn't it be cheaper to supply garbage and bathrooms than to pay for that cleanup later? Well, we have, uh, from the point in time count last year, we have about 210 homeless per 100,000 people. Uh, but we only have about 450 that are, were unsheltered on a particular uh, night. Uh, so we don't have thousands and thousands. Uh, and we've got to make sure that uh, we uh, offer them shelter beds, and those that need shelter beds or want shelter beds can have those. Uh, and then we're going to enforce our camping bans to try and get uh, illegal campers to move in uh, to shelter. But those who resist, um, you know, what we're going to do is give them notice, and if they don't uh, remove the camp, we're going to remo remove it for them. Uh, if there weren't shelter beds, then we had to leave the camp by, by law on uh, uh, public property. What I think we're going to do is strategically place uh, some, uh, uh, what do you call garbage dumpsters, bins? The dumpsters. Dumpsters, yeah. exactly right. Uh, six to eight dumpsters. And I gotta uh, tell you, Jen, they're primarily for the benefit of the folks cleaning up the camps. Mm -hmm. We hope that homeless people will use them, uh, but we also need them to be available so that we can quickly clean, clean up the camps when they don't move after having been, the camps been posted and they're, they're told to move. Uh, bathrooms are a, are a different issue. Um, if the city gets into the facilitating of homeless camps, uh, then do we become liable for the activity, uh, the drug use, 
uh, some of the assaultive behavior. And frankly, uh, there's a concern that uh, if you supply outhouses and things like that, uh, the city somehow facilitates some criminal behavior associated with those. It's a little tougher question. I think the easier one uh, is the dumpsters. Uh, the conversation's going to continue. Uh, the one thing I will tell you is all the meetings I've been at, uh, mayor's conferences, a National League of Cities, uh, there is almost universal sentiment against uh, city-organized camps. Uh, across the country, they have become uh, imminent health hazards. Uh, they tend to have uncontrollable growth. And uh, virtually every city that tried it um, backtracked and regretted doing so. And in some of our cities, we've had homeless overtake city parks mm -hmm. uh, that were set up to be, uh, you know, homeless camps, and they, it just got out of control. So I don't think you'll see that in Colorado Springs. We can't control what private landowners decide to do mm -hmm. uh, until it becomes a health hazard. Uh, but you know, we'll we'll continue the conversation. But I, I would not look for any city-organized camps. Okay, and beneficial to keep looking at what others are doing. That's exactly right. Okay, uh, also from Natalie on Facebook, would the city consider taking um, some city-owned land and converting it into a campground? I think you answered that. I, I pretty much yeah. answered that. Yeah, uh, who are experiencing homes. That is not the direction that cities are going. Mm -hmm. uh, those that have tried it have not had good experiences. Okay. Uh, Rachel on Facebook would like to know, did we have representation on the right to rest hearing at the state capitol? That law will be a disaster for Colorado Springs. If you don't mind giving a tiny bit of background if folks have not heard. Yeah, there is a uh, homeless um, sympathizers, homeless supporters, and homeless groups themselves have uh, sponsored through a, uh, a state legislature by the name of uh, Joe Salazar a bill which is kind of a homeless bill of rights or a right to rest, uh, saying you they can rest on sidewalks, they can uh, any, base, any place in, they want to, things like that, uh, which is, of course, contrary to uh, what I think we have done in a very constructive fashion, say you can rest in parks and things like that, but you can't rest in business areas on the sidewalk and block entrances uh, to businesses and things like that. The answer is yes. Uh, Peter Wysocki uh, testified in, in uh, opposition to it. We had a testimony last year in opposition to it. Our, uh, the city lobbyist is very actively lobbying against it. Even if it gets out of the uh, House, we're pretty confident it will not survive the Senate. So okay. uh, we are very aware of the bill. We oppose it and uh, hope that it will not get any greater traction. And Peter Wysocki, the head of our planning department, for folks who don't know. And moving on to um, the next topic, tourism, we have another question on Facebook. What is our hotel occupancy rate for this year's outlook, and what is the city doing to boost tourism in 2018? Uh, the hotel occupancy picture is very bright. We've had record rates the last two summers, well into the 90s. Uh, we expect that again this summer. All indications are uh, from all the hoteliers I'm talking to, uh, motel owners, uh, we're going to have a very, very good summer. Okay. Uh, absent right. some, you know, disaster or anything like that. Right. Our uh, lodging and rental tax, I think, was up 13% last year ever, having been up, you know, 15% the year before. Uh, so uh, the tourism economy looks really good. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a recent uh, newspaper, matter of fact, this morning, an article about the fact that the Broadmoor may have to close the incline for a year or two, look at whether the, you know, close the, um, I'm sorry, the, the Cog Railway, the Cog Railway yes. and look at whether it's financially viable going forward. Uh, I think it's an iconic uh, tourism venue, and I very much hope that the numbers work for the Broadmoor and they're able to uh, invest the money they need uh, to have, you know, update it. Uh, bring in new engines and things like that and still have it the fantastic uh, uh, tourism attraction that it's been for many years. Yeah, part of our history. It really sure. is. Yeah. Uh, it's been there 125 years. Yeah. Um, okay, so great numbers, great trend on that topic. Next topic, Banning Lewis Ranch. Judy on Facebook would like to know, will the city services provided to Banning Lewis Ranch be phased in from west to east or will the entire property be allowed to move forward with haphazard growth, disorderly development? 
That's a very good uh, question, and I think it's one of the market differences uh, between this uh, proposed uh, uh, annexation agreement that we're talking about and the original one. The original one hard zoned the entire uh, acreage. There was very little flexibility involved, and that's frankly one of the things that made it uneconomical uh, to, to develop. Uh, here we're cut, kind of cutting it up in chunks. Uh, the first development will be about a third uh, and, you know, it could take 20 to 30 years to develop it. It will be done in three, 400 acre PUDs and things like that. So you can look at every single uh, proposal, uh, see how it fits in with a master plan and make sure that it's got the right mix and things like that and isn't haphazardly done. Uh, so I actually think the amended annexation agreement that we're talking about uh, fosters that a view that she's talking about. Mm -hmm. I think she can expect that the development will take place primarily west to east because it's always uh, less expensive to develop the closer you are to uh, utilities and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's only natural uh, that Banning Lewis Ranch will for the most part develop from west to east. And I think before the whole thing's built out, will probably be 50 years or something, 50, 60 years. Okay, and give us a reminder on the timeline for the Banning Lewis Ranch, what's happening at this point. Um, we hope uh, to get the amended annexation agreement approved by the council late April. Okay. Uh, this is, uh, you know, the initial annexation agreement was 1988, and um, it was just not something that uh, the land could be economically developed under. And the problem is that urban sprawl has leapfrogged Banning Lewis Ranch and gone out to Falcon and on its way to, uh, to Calhan. And the city has lost billions of dollars of development within the city. And in my opinion, and I think many others, it's become an infill project. Mm -hmm. And we uh, need, because we've only got 6,000 other developable acres in, in Colorado Springs other than Banning Lewis Ranch, uh, we need to turn our attention there, uh, deliver a high quality of life for the the homeowners that move there and also make sure that the development pays for itself and that's what we're doing in the with the new annexation agreement. Okay. Moving on to infrastructure. Uh uh, Sue on Facebook, what happened to the pothole tax? Not one street that I drive has had a pothole fixed. Sue, that's hard to believe. And no no offense to Sue. Uh but uh we've had, you know, four hundred and seventy one miles of roads that had potholes on them. Uh, completely redone. Mm -hmm. uh, over and above that, we filled 90,000 potholes last year. Now, just to make sure that Sue understands, 2C was for the uh, overlays and the reconstruction of roads, not to fill uh, potholes. Not a pothole tax. Although, when right. we obviously redo the road, we obviously fix any uh, potholes. But over and above that, Mm -hmm. We have fixed uh, 90,000 potholes, so it's pretty hard to imagine that she's driving on any roads. Uh, most of the, We've done a lot of major arterials. We're going to do a lot, an, another large group of major arterials in the 2018 2C. Uh, what I tell uh, uh, Sue is to get the GoCo Springs app. It's a free app. Uh, get on it, report any pothole. You can take a picture of it. Uh, send really it in, easy, yeah. And we'll figure out by GPS where it is, and it takes us on an average uh, 10 days to two weeks to fix it. So if she actually knows the potholes that aren't being fixed, she can fix that by using the GoCo Springs app um, and or call one in. Uh, it takes on the average about nine, 10 days, no more than two weeks to get them fixed. Okay, and coloradosprings.gov slash 2C is another great place to see which streets are on tap to right. be, you and know, this what's summer, next? Uh, we're going to be very aggressive this summer. Okay. A lot of big uh, arterials. Okay. Moving on to next topic, marijuana. Uh, Michael on Facebook asking, why can Colorado Springs not have recreational cannabis sales and smoke bars? Because as of now, the voters or the legislative bodies have not uh, condoned that. If you recall, uh, after the uh, passage of uh, Amendment 64, uh, Colorado Springs uh, voted, uh, I think the council actually voted five to four to allow uh, med medicinal marijuana. County, it was a close, close vote for medicinal marijuana, but neither have allowed recreational. Mm -hmm. Most of what you're talking about there is uh, recreational. Right. Uh, 
there's some talk in the marijuana industry of going to the voters and uh, trying to see if they can change that. I've seen some polls that frankly don't look very good for them. Uh, my position on this is pretty well known. Um, I'm an opponent of recreational marijuana for a city that prides itself in its military uh, support. We have five major military installations, and I know from my discussions with the uh, uh, Department of Defense, they would much prefer that the city does not embrace uh, recreational marijuana. And we're also, of course, very much uh, uh, selling our city as Olympic City USA. The, uh, with the Olympic values, excellence, uh, friendship, respect, uh, and getting high for fun is not a message that uh, meshes with that very well. So uh, we'll see what the voters uh, do in the future, but as of right now, uh, there's not a sentiment to embrace that type of uh, recreational marijuana activity. Okay. Um, next topic, traffic. Um... Louise on Facebook, can we please figure out how to slow traffic down on Circle, especially at night between 9 and midnight? She's saying the speeders know there are no speed traps at night. Um, we do need to, um, one of the reasons we need to increase the number of police officers we have, and I think last time I was here we talked about the fact that we're going to add 120 police officers probably in the next four years. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we need is more traffic enforcement. Uh, I hear that loud and clear. We are going to implement uh, red light cameras, and I want to emphasize that these were not, you know, shortening the period of the uh, uh, yellow light. light. Cycle, yeah. uh, we are. You will not get a ticket unless you enter on a red light. But we need to slow down these uh, red light runners. Uh, it's very dangerous. We're going to have mobile uh, cameras so we can move them uh, as intersections become more problematic. Uh, but we also need more traffic enforcement now, and I think will be a priority of the department as we add more officers. Absolutely. Okay. Last um, topic and question comes from Zachary on Twitter. What options are there for new people to engage with you to discuss bringing ideas, some great ideas to COS from other cities? Well, you can go on city websites, uh, connect COS, things like that, make your uh, vision known. But I, I think... What I would encourage people to do is look for long, longer-term ways to contribute. Monitor all the uh, boards and commissions that the city has. Mm -hmm. We're always looking for, you know, some of the boards and commissions you have to have quite a bit of experience in a particular area, um, you know, whether it be plumbing or heating or something like that. But others, we're looking for uh, average citizens that just want to participate and let the, let the city know how they feel about things and kind of be a uh, a voice for uh, other citizens. And I think if people look at the uh, boards and commissions, they'll find something that uh, might interest them. And, uh, you know, you'll have to go through an application process. And well, Especially uh, if they're coming from other places. They can exactly really right. contribute in terms of this it's a worked, good way, this didn't. Yeah. It's a good way to get involved with the city. And I encourage people. One of the things that I think is great about Cairo Springs, even though it's the 40th largest city in America, we still have a pretty good small town feel. Mm -hmm. uh, you can penetrate uh, Colorado Springs and find out who's who and what's what uh, pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people appreciate that. Yeah. And I would encourage folks to look for ways to get involved. Yeah, we try to make it as easy as possible. You bet. And that's, we appreciate your time today. And we also appreciate all the questions. We encourage you to keep sending those in to us. We hope to have more Facebook Lives in the future. And we also encourage you to visit our website, coloradosprings.gov, for more information um, on many of these topics and much more. Thanks so much and have a great day.